this first Tuesday lecture series for fall 2021. I'm Mark Lanting. I'm the Dean of Communication and Humanities here at the college, and it's my privilege to introduce tonight's lecturer, Professor Brian Wagner. Uh, Professor Wagner has presented several lect lectures for this series in the past. He's lectured on topics of ethics and postmodernism and uh, flat earth conspiracy theories, as I remember it. Uh, most recently. Uh, Professor Wagner earned his Associate of Arts degree in Foreign Languages at Vincennes University, his BA and MA degrees in Philosophy at Northern Illinois University. He teaches Introduction to Philosophy, Medical Ethics, Intro to Religion, World Religions, Northwestern Philosophy, uh, Religion in American Society, and Foundational Religious Texts. So please join me in welcoming Professor Brian Wagner. All right, I'm gonna to try to use the lapel mic because I like to move around, uh, but if you can't hear me, just let me know. Well, I'm gonna take my mask off too. I guess I can do that now. That's why we had such a big room, right? Make some space. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can talk about when you're discussing 9-11, and we could spend hours just dealing with any one of the topics we're gonna to be looking at in this, in this lecture. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do is just hit some of the highlights and then leave any of the details for the Q&A later. So if you do want to dive into something deep and say, let's talk about that thing, let's do that in the Q&A. But for now, what I want to do is just sort of like lay out how conspiracy theories tend to work and to look at examples of them from the 9-11 uh, conspiracy uh, uh, example and then to uh, show how conspiracy theories can be evaluated as either true or false. Now, this is a very heavy topic, so I understand that it's not easy to discuss 9-11 without getting a little bit, you know, emotional. And so I ask that everyone please try to remain civilized while we're having this discussion, and I also ask that you not beat me up. Um, because it's such a heavy topic, I have interspersed some slides with animals on them so that we can just have a quick reprieve every once in a while. So if you see some animals on the screen, it's just to say, okay, let's just take a quick moment to breathe in and remember that the world is actually a good place. So uh, let's just right, dive right into it. The first thing we need to do is to define our terms, right? We have to talk about what a conspiracy theory is to begin with. And I'd like to point out that a conspiracy theory offers an explanation of past or ongoing or future events or circumstances that cites as a main causal factor a small group of powerful persons the conspirators, acting in secret for their own benefit and against the common good. There's two key features to a conspiracy theory is that they are done in secret and that they are done for some form of malevolence against the common good in this case. So notice that it is an explanation of past events and therefore that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true or false. That is, it's just offering an explanation. And typically, a conspiracy theory is in contrast to the popular explanation. So there is an, an official story that's being presented in each one of these conspiracy theory cases. But the conspiracy theory often operates as an alternative to that official story, saying that there's another version, there's another interpretation of what's going on in the situation. So what I want to do is to look at the official story and then compare some of the alternative stories that have been proposed over the past 20 years regarding 9-11, and that's what we're gonna do today. So the official story goes like this, that four planes were hijacked by 19 uh, terrorists who flew them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, and that the planes caused catastrophic damage to those buildings, causing the buildings to collapse due to the uh, structural damage and the weight of the building, and that World Trade Center Building 7 also collapsed later that day due to collateral damage and thermal expansion. Also, Flight 93 crashed in a field due to, oops, sorry, what happened there? This thing's kind of going crazy, hold on. I don't know where to aim it. The Flight 93 also crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That's the last bullet point on that slide. So there were uh, four planes hijacked by 19 terrorists. The first plane hit the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. The second plane hit the South Tower at 9.03, just 15 minutes later. Then the Pentagon was hit just about a half an hour after that. 
So you can imagine, right, that day was just full of news. We were just constantly being made aware that something new had happened and nobody really could explain what was going on. And then just half an hour later, uh, we got reports that a plane had crashed in a farm, in a field just outside of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The Twin Towers then began to fall during that time period, and the South Tower collapsed first, which is interesting to a lot of people because it was the second tower that was hit by planes, but it was the first tower to fall down. Then the North Tower collapsed just about half an hour later, and World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed about six hours after that. All in all, there were almost 3,000 people killed that day, which is what makes this such a heavy topic, especially knowing and seeing the pictures and knowing that people were dying in those pictures. It's a very difficult uh, thing to deal with. So when we parcel that up, we have the passengers of the four airplanes, the crew members, the 19 hijackers, and all of the civilians located in the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and their surrounding areas. So that's the official story. The conspiracy theories offer us an alternative to that. And so the way that conspiracy theories tend to work are these basic uh, tactics, as we'll call them. The first thing that a conspiracy theory will do is to try to cast doubt on the official story. They'll say that there's something wrong with what the official story says. And if they can dismantle that, then they can present you with an alternative story in its place. They oftentimes change their story to fit the conclusion in this case, most of the conspiracy theories say that the US government did 9-11. That's the phrase that's used. You see it on bumper stickers, right? Uh, that 9-11 was an inside job. And most conspiracy theories say that as their alternative, although we'll look at some of those variations in just a minute. They also tend to focus on the anomalies of the situation, pointing out to certain situations that seem odd and to say that there's something wrong with the official story because this anomalous feature is happening and they're looking for an explanation. They don't think the official story satisfies it. They also oftentimes insert or assert incorrect data. And so this is one of the problems with evaluating the conspiracy theories to see, is this, are the claims made by the conspiracy theorists accurate? Uh, are they saying things that are true? And so you have to go through the process of figuring that out. And that might require understanding of how architecture works or physics works or how uh, chemistry works. And most people don't have that knowledge, but uh, many conspiracy theorists uh, claim to know something about that. They also assume confidence when there is a lack of evidence. And that's, I think, is a, a pretty easy giveaway for conspiracy theories, is that uh, people say that they are certain that this alternative version is true, even though they may not have adequate evidence to, to support that. And that, I think, is a common trait of most conspiracy theories, not just in 9-11, but people will assert this with extreme confidence when they don't have it, or they shouldn't have it. And finally, they also rely on imagination to kind of uh, motivate the theory so that they say, well, look, you can imagine this. And when we talked about flat earth conspiracy theories, notice that flat earth conspiracy theories are based purely on imagination. They don't offer any evidence of the flat earth. They just paint pictures and, and create ideas in your head spending most of their time casting doubt on the official story. So let's see where that happens here in 9-11 and try to evaluate it. And let's just note that it's almost impossible to prove a conspiracy theory to be false. Why? Because there's always a slight possibility, and I say possibility, meaning that it is theoretically possible that some people could be conspiring within the government to pull off some of these actions. We can't always prove that if it's done in secret. The fact that conspiracies are done in secret is what makes them so elusive and what keeps the conspiracy theory going. So uh, we have to then look at the degrees of probability, and that's where we're going to be talking about our, our levels of confidence. So when we cast suspicion, right, people will say things like this. Well, the pictures that you're looking at were faked. Or the video footage that you're looking at is unreliable. Uh, someone could have made it up, uh, staged it. They might say things like evidence could be planted. Right? So you're looking at evidence uh, from the videos or from the pictures or maybe even real life uh, eyewitness testimonies or, or things like that. They say, well, look, you, the government could have planted evidence and, and that's uh, supposed to uh, present the idea that the government was in on it. They were planting evidence all along. Or that the eyewitness testimonies uh, are not reliable because those people are paid actors. 
These are claims that conspiracy theorists will use in any conspiracy theory. But notice, in each one of these, they're not offering you evidence that the photographs are faked or that the footage is unreliable or that the evidence is planted or that they are paid actors. They're simply positing those as possibilities and then using that as part of their evidence for the conspiracy theory. But that's not evidence for the conspiracy theory. That's simply casting suspicion on the official story. So you have to be careful here, right? Um, it is possible, theoretically, that photographs could be faked, that video footage could be doctored, and that evidence could be planted. But we need reasons to believe that. We need to know if there's any reasons why we should accept that version of their story. So uh, some of the things that they've said in regard to 9-11 is that there were a bunch of World Trade Center managers investigating the outcome of a plane impact in the late 1990s. And if you know your history, you'll know why they were doing that. They did it because Osama bin Laden hired some guys in Al Qaeda to send some trucks full of explosives into the bottom of the World Trade Center in 1993, and they were trying to figure out if he tries to do this again, what would be his next tactic? And they thought, well, what if planes hit the building? So there is documented evidence of these managers looking at that possibility and asking the question, what would happen if that were the case? This creates suspicion. I'm sure it's maybe even happening in your own mind. Bush's stock investments went up just before 9-11. Suspicious, right? Did he know? So it, it creates doubt in you. It may, may be working on you right now. That the Pentagon just recently renovated wedge number three before 9-11, and that's exactly where the plane hit. So did they know that the plane was going to hit that part, and that's why they renovated it? Sounds suspicious, doesn't it? Or that there were training routines going on that day within the military looking at scenarios where uh, there might be a hijacked plane or that a plane was going to be used in an attack. And they were running scenarios that day on that very thing. Suspicious. NORAD was allegedly offline that day. And I have not seen any proof that that's true. But I haven't seen any proof that it's false either. So I'm not sure about this one. But it does cast suspicion that our North American air defense was down during the most tragic day of our, our history. Uh, I don't know if that's actually true, though. And that there was a bunch of papers on a stool. Right? There's a Netflix documentary called In Plain Sight. And they, ca they cast a shade on the official story, trying to argue that uh, if the Pentagon was hit by an airplane, then this stool up here should be burnt up. So if you look at the stool up close, you can see there's a piece of paper, there's piles of papers on the stool, and yet there's no flame. And so the documentary is looking at that picture and just asking the question, why did this happen? Now, in my mind, I showed this actually to a bunch of students, and they all laughed. And they were like, see, Brian, that's it. And so some of you might be thinking, wow, that's proof right there. But in my mind, I'm asking this question. If it wasn't a plane that hit it, then what caused this explosion and fire, and what explains that stool in the alternative stories. If it was a rocket that hit this, and that's what many people think, that it was a rocket that hit the Pentagon, why didn't the rocket burn up that stool? It's the same problem. So you have to look at things from both sides and ask, does that provide evidence one way or the other? So the truth is, and here's a better picture of the stool, if you can see it. Right, are these coincidences? Here's the stool again. You can see it now down lower, a little clearer picture. They had just renovated this part of the wedge. And some things that most people don't, aren't aware of is that they were going through the process of fireproofing all of the walls in that wedge. That was one of the renovations they did uh, in case there was a fire. They didn't want anything to transmit from building to building or from room to room. And these walls had just collapsed, exposing, oops, sorry, exposing that wall. And so the stool is sitting in uh, open air because that wall had just fallen down a wall that had been renovated to prevent uh, any fires from transmitting. So uh, when that wall collapsed, the fire had not gotten to it yet, and that stool remains untouched because the building had just collapsed. Now, like I said, they had actually renovated that area, which was actually fortunate for the people who worked at the Pentagon because, they, because of the renovations, most of the people hadn't moved into their new offices that, that week. And therefore, um, there would have been a lot more people who would have died had it been an older section of the Pentagon. But 
you know, conspiracy theorists would say, oh, that's just further proof that the government was in on it. They purposely moved people out so they could blow up that part of the building. So this kind of works uh, for both sides of the story. But they uh, did renovate that very section just a um, month prior to this. Now, other versions of the 9-11 story include the following. And this is one of the things that is interesting to me, to see how the story has changed. Uh, I first became aware of 9-11 conspiracy theories within a year of 9-11. There was a documentary before YouTube was created uh, that was being sent around the internet in an email, and I got that email pretty early on, and it was called Loose Change. And I remember watching the first version of that documentary and just totally engrossed with it because I was like, what the heck is this about? And uh, I kept watching it over and over again, memorizing it, studying it, asking questions. And then they put out a second version, which reworked all the theories and changed the story. And then they put out a third version and did it again, and they changed the story again. And I kept asking, if they have to keep changing the story, then how do I know the first story was right? And how do I know which story is correct? So here's one version of the story, right? Uh, White House officials knew about the attacks before, beforehand, but they did nothing to stop it. Now, I actually have nothing to say about this alternative uh, uh, story. I, I don't know if the White House knew about it or not, but my point is that neither do you. Nobody really knows what they knew and what they didn't know, and there may have been information that was hinting toward a, an alleged attack that day, but they get those on a daily basis. And what they have to decide is to figure out, well, when are the legitimate attacks? Right? Um, I never know uh, when a you know, potential threat is going to uh, be serious, and so you just have to kind of filter through the data and say, well, uh, we didn't know it was gonna happen, but we did have um, some reasons to believe it. So I don't have anything more to say about that one. That's, that's, that doesn't mean that it was an inside job. But the other ones do imply that White House officials worked with the terrorists to plan and execute the attacks. Um, again, want to ask, is there any evidence that the White House was working with the 19 terrorists to pull this off, just as it was? Or that the White House uh, officials framed 19 people while orchestrating the attacks themselves? The government did 9-11, but they framed it on these 19 guys because they were the scapegoats. Or that the White House officials moved all of the passengers onto Flight 93 and then shot it down, and that's why there's no evidence of, of those passengers, because they were all moved uh, to a different plane. That's what the first version of loose change claimed in 2002. The White House officials used thermite and or explosives to bring down the towers. That's a very popular theory that still goes around to this day. So there weren't, wasn't the planes that brought down the towers, it was actually explosives and thermite being used. We'll talk about that later. Or that the White House officials replaced the, the passenger planes with military aircraft and then plunged the passenger airlines into the ocean where no one would find them. Talk about that theory in a minute. Or that the White House officials used Tomahawk missiles instead of planes to hit the Pentagon. Or that no planes were actually used in any of the attacks. Some people think that uh, this was all just done by uh, remote controls, explosives, and um, uh, missiles, perhaps. Uh, or that some people have even claimed that the whole event was a deep fake and that we were just watching news and somebody was scamming us like a, was that uh, uh, Wells or Orwell? What am I thinking of? Uh, w, you know, the, the, the guy who did uh, the alien one. Wells, thank you, Orson Wells, yeah. So some people claim that 9-11 didn't even happen, which raises a lot of questions for me. So which version then is correct, right? If these are the alternatives, is there any evidence for them and how do we know which one's true and which one's false? So there were um, hijackers that are, according to the official story, from Saudi Arabia, all between the ages of 22 and 33 years old. Uh, Saudi nationals, many of them connected to Al-Qaeda. In fact, that's the most recent report that was just released this weekend uh, was that these, um, these people all had ties to Al-Qaeda and that uh, the uh, Arabian government may have been involved in that. That's the stuff that was just released by the president this weekend. So we know exactly who these guys were. We know, in fact, we know who the missing person was. There's supposed to be a 20th guy there, but he was not admitted to the United States uh, through immigration, and therefore um, he didn't make it to his plane. We know exactly where they sat 
Notice that it's the same areas on each one of the planes. We even have recordings from the planes, and you can actually, there's uh, a resource on, on the web. You can just Google that and listen to all of the recordings from that day, both from the airlines, uh, from the military, from the um, uh, American Airlines headquarters, and from passengers. Betty Young was the first person to actually make a phone call to say that her plane had been hijacked, and they stayed with her on the phone until it crashed, and they realized what was going on. Um, uh, Nydia Gonzalez also reported a stabbing on board her plane, on a different plane, and uh, reported that uh, they had been hijacked. So these are recordings. You can listen to them if you wish to. They're a little bit explicit and gruesome. Uh, Peter Hansen called his father that day to report that people were throwing up and getting sick and that the plane was making jerky movements and that he didn't think that there was an official pilot on board the plane. In fact, Flight 93 and Flight 11 both made announcements over the air traffic control channels instead of the intercom system from the hijackers saying that they had taken over the planes and had bombs on board. And then at 8.44, Madeline Sweeney also reported jerky, awkward flying for Flight 11. And uh, that was indicating that they were uh, descending toward uh, the Twin Towers. And then uh, she says, something's wrong. We're in a rapid descent. We're all over the place. And soon the phone call was cut off. We also have the recordings of the transmissions from the terrorists themselves. So we have uh, them as well saying that we have some planes. Just stay quiet. You'll be OK. We are returning to the airport not realizing they weren't talking to the passengers. They were talking to flight control headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, seconds later, they say, nobody move. Everything will be OK. If you don't make any moves, you'll endanger yourself and the plane. Just stay quiet. And then again, at 9.30, Flight 93, they get the same thing, a report coming. Just remain uh, sitting. We have a bomb on board. And shortly thereafter, the plane crashed. We do have evidence that there were hijackers. And when people look at the footage, they say, that doesn't look like a passenger plane. Uh, one person thinks that that could be a military plane or a cargo plane. In fact, one person on the news actually said, I didn't see any windows on the plane. And therefore, the, the claim is made that it wasn't a passenger plane to begin with. This was made by Mark Bernbach from Fox News, said that it definitely did not look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the sides. And therefore, he thought this wasn't a, a, a civilian aircraft. Now, the problem is, is that when Mark Bernbach made that statement, he was two miles away from where the towers were. And uh, again, you could look at the picture and you can try to guess, right? Can you make out pictures of a plane that's moving 400 miles per hour tell if there are windows from two miles away. He actually later admitted that he thought it was a passenger jet. So he has changed his story. So is this a person being paid off? Or did he actually see a cargo plane hit the building? And he's also ignoring all of the other eyewitness testimonies of people who thought they saw a passenger plane. So what conspiracy theories are doing is they're looking at this one isolated event saying, see, this person doesn't see a passenger plane. Therefore, it must not be when you ignore all the other testimony, eyewitness testimonies that day, who did see passenger planes. And furthermore, there are photos of the wreckage of the plane windows. So here's a picture of the wreckage from the Twin Towers after they collapsed. People say there are no windows. Oh, look, here they are. So there is evidence that there were windows on the planes that hit the Twin Towers. And we have that evidence, at least in part. Selective evidence, when you only pick out certain details and you try to report that as, as, as if that is the justification, um, that's ignoring the other parts of the evidence that might be counterfactuals. The AP News actually records several people who were near the Pentagon when Flight 77 hit. And, and I like AP News because it just gives you the raw data. You just get to see their reports and they say, you know, oh, this is what I saw. And yet there's no commentary. There's no newsman telling you, you know, what to think about it. It's just raw data, and it's great. But even on YouTube, they have uh, snippets of this where they're reporting all these people saying they saw a plane, and then one guy says, 
No, I didn't see no plane, didn't hear no plane. Like I said, all I heard was the impact and then the flame. This huge ball of fire came over the building. And they focus on that, and you can read the comments to this YouTube video. It's strange, because I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking something completely different than all the people on the comment section. Because the comment sections are full of, see, it's proof. It was staged. It wasn't a plane. That guy admits it, and he knows it. This guy is not admitting anything, right? So this is the theory that the rocket hit the Pentagon, and this guy didn't see or hear a plane. Now, let's ignore the poor grammar here. Technically, he's saying he did see a plane and that he did hear it. But just ignore that grammar mistake, and let's give him the benefit of the doubt and recognize that he's not seeing anything. There's no evidence that there was a rocket. He didn't see a rocket. So that really raises the question, well, then what was the explosion? He just may not have been in a position to see it, and somehow that's proof that it wasn't a plane? That doesn't work. That's not how evidence works. You have to look at things from both sides. Um, well, I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, conspiracy theorists will frequently use vague information like that as proof for their alternative story. But that's not uh, good evidence, right? When they look at pictures, they think that looks like a rocket launcher underneath the plane. They think this looks like it was photoshopped because it doesn't look like there's an explosion uh, in the plane. Uh, they think that uh, this indicates that, uh, that there was no plane in the picture, so therefore it wasn't a plane at the Pentagon. But notice in all of these photographs, it's very pixelated. It's very fuzzy. And yet they're basing this as their arguments for the alternative stories. That's not good evidence. You want something crystal clear. Now, I'm not saying that um, it means that they're definitely false. I don't know. Now, all I'm saying is that I can't really derive much information from these pictures. They're not very good pictures. So when you look at both sides of that uh, story, saying that there's no camera footage of an airplane hitting the Pentagon is supposed to be proof that there was no airplane hitting the Pentagon. But that's not true, is it? Just saying that there is no footage means that there is no footage of a plane hitting it. It doesn't mean that a plane didn't hit it. So you can ask the other side of the story and say, well, wait a minute. There's also no footage of a rocket hitting the Pentagon. So if that logic holds, then wouldn't that mean that there was no rocket all either? You see, it doesn't work. You can't have it both ways. Either the lack of footage means it wasn't there, which means there was no rocket either, or the lack of evidence means we don't know. And maybe that's the appropriate response we need to have. There are certain things we could just say, I don't know what the answer is, and we have to be comfortable in the uncertainty of things. We don't always know the answers. So people look at the underside of this plane and they think, oh, that may be a rocket launcher. Some people have made a lot of uh, hay about this uh, bubble on the side of the plane because it looks like it's on one side and they claim that uh, in this version of the story, they claim that there was an explosion that occurred in the building before the plane even hit. And again, the conspirators will uh, slow down the, the reel and show it frame by frame and claim that the explosion occurs before the nose hit. But they're looking at granulated pictures and it's not very clear, and I'm the whole time saying, I don't see what they're getting at here. Um, maybe I just need to get my vision checked. So they're looking at that part of the plane saying, is that a rocket launcher, and did the government plant that so that they could use this rockets to take down the Twin Towers? When, when you look at a real picture with clarity, you can see that that could just be shadows on the bottom of the plane where the fuselage meets uh, connects the wing to the, the main part of the, the ship. Uh, there's no rocket launcher there. And you can also ask, why didn't anyone on the ground say, hey, what's that rocket launcher doing underneath my plane? Or flight crews or, or people who are working in the maintenance area, right? So if there is um, a pod underneath there, how come nobody mentions it? And what would it take to actually put a pod underneath a plane like that? Right? Military and aviation experts say that it's impossible to retrofit a passenger plane to be able to carry heavy artillery like that without affecting the flight patterns of the, the ship. In fact, Frederick Kulik says that you'd have to have the means of setting it off, releasing the, the bomb, the rocket, and arming it. And there are all sorts of systems involved connecting uh, the, those uh, rocket launcher systems to the pilot, and it would require a lot of metalwork and wiring, and yet you don't see any evidence of that. So it doesn't seem there was a rocket launcher there. Doudney, uh, A.K. Doudney, actually believes that 
All three of the planes were forced to land at Harrisburg National Air Airport and uh, have all the passengers get off. They all got onto Flight 93, and then Flight 93 was shot down by an A-10 Thunderbolt. The reason why A.K. Dowdney says this is because in the uh, TV footage afterwards, uh, one of the camera stations or uh, TV stations was making uh, a point that um, there was an airplane in the sky after a Shanksville crash. And so they're asking, well, what was that plane doing there? And Dowdney believes it was a A-10 Thunderbolt, even though you can't see the plane very clearly in the news feed. And then he believes that the other three planes were flown by remote control to the Atlantic Ocean and that three cargo planes were used in their place to take down the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. Well, where's the evidence? Right? How do you know that to be true? He's partly basing that on the cargo plane testimony in Fox News. So um, he also claims that the uh, flight, the pilots, the terrorists, would not have the experience to fly a plane with that accuracy to hit such small targets in the DC and New York uh, cityscapes. But um, pilots actually don't have to perform. Um, they didn't, th these people didn't have to perform the most severe tasks of flight, takeoff, landing, or flying through bad weather. It was a clear day. Uh, the plane was already in the sky, and they didn't have to land. They just had to hit a target. So uh, that's their only task. It's a very simple task uh, once they took control of the cockpit. Okay, and there's a baby horse for you. Just kind of reset there. You're welcome. You can also look at uh, conspiracy theorists that claim that some of these uh, pipes must have been cut uh, and that therefore it wasn't the planes that took it down, that it must be some type of thermite that caused this to come down, unaware of the fact that they did have to cut down some of these pipes to remove the shrapnel from the site. So these were cut, but not before 9-11. They were cut after the buildings had already collapsed. So that's just misinformation raising suspicion about the official story. Uh, conspiracy theorists oftentimes look at the video footage of earlier this day, saying there's no engine here on the corner of the street. But then later on that day, they see an engine on the corner of the street and ask, where did the plane part come from? Well, these pictures are not very good. If you can tell, these two columns are actually located here and here. But the plane part is located behind them next to the third column, which you can't even see in these pictures. Here's the full photograph. And there's the first two columns, there's the third one, and there's the engine. In fact, here's a picture of the same engine before the building had even collapsed, before there was even dust in the air. So you know that engine was already there, but yet they claim that the FBI planted it there. Where's the evidence for that? There's a picture of the, how the planes would have hit the building, that the objects, the fuselage, the landing gear, and the engine would have collapsed in these locations. This is the corner of Murray Street and Church. And there's the engine flying out. And there it is on Murray Street. The planes, of course, are mostly made of aluminum to make them lightweight. The most uh, heavy objects on the plane are the engines and the landing gear. And those are the things that tended to uh, fly out from the buildings uh, because of their weight and mass. So confidence, right? Cognitive dissonance causes people to dig in their heels deeper because when you're confronted with counter evidence, people don't want to be embarrassed, right? I don't want to be proven wrong, so I'm going to dig in my heels and I'm going to make it even stronger, right? Brian, you don't understand. There's more evidence out there. I'm like, I know, I've seen it. And it's also as inconclusive as what we've seen so far. Conspiracy theorists assert certainty where there isn't any. Right? They're postulating theories, they're po postulating ideas, but they don't have the, the warrant to say that this is definitely true. And that's, I think, a red flag. Um, and then when they're questioned, they use caps locks to make their point, as if that makes their evidence stronger. It doesn't. Critical thinkers acknowledge there are different levels of certitude, and when you recognize that, you have to be cautious and say, well, wait, I don't fully know what happened, but here's where the evidence points. And there are degrees of certainty. And I think that's what makes people uncomfortable, is that if you don't know for sure, well, how do you deal with that? How do you wrestle with that? It's hard to live in uh, uh, uncertainty. 
So if you're searching for the truth, then your beliefs have to be revisable. But if somebody confronts you with counter evidence, you can't just dig in your heels. You have to say, well, let's look at that together. Let's examine the counter evidence. And I do that with conspiracy theories as well as the counter proofs for those conspiracy theories. That's why I'm so interested in this. It's kind of fun to do that volume back and forth, looking at both sides, analyzing, and comparing the data. I'll, I'll do that at the very end of the presentation today. What people tend to do, this is known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, is that as they gain in wisdom, as they gain in knowledge, they at first develop a high degree of confidence of what, what they've learned. And a lot of conspiracy theorists fall into this camp where uh, they learn something new and they're like, oh, wow, I know something, and therefore, it's definitely a conspiracy theory. I'm sorry, it's definitely a conspiracy. But then they learn a little bit more information, and they're like, oh, well, maybe I didn't know what I was talking about after all. Then you start looking at the data, and it's the more you learn, the more you study, you gain more and more expertise, and that puts you in a better position to know. And I think that's what we have to recognize. Where are we on the spectrum? Do you really know a lot about physics? Do you really know about chemistry? Do you really know a lot about architecture? That one's for you. So well, let's evaluate some of the evidence, right? If you examine both sides of the story, you can ask the question, is this molten aluminum, and there's a lot of aluminum in those buildings carrying the air ducts, or is that thermite melting steel? It looks the same. And so the question is, which of those theories is correct? And conspiracy theorists have been presenting the idea that there were either explosives or that somebody had installed thermite devices to go off in the buildings to cause them to collapse. They don't think the planes could have brought them down. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But, um, oh, and the other uh, conspiracy theory says that these are explosions that went off before the building even got to that level, saying, well, what's going on here if not a controlled demolition? And they oftentimes point to these little outbursts of uh, debris coming out a few of the windows saying that that shows that there's a controlled demolition going on. So does that work as evidence for the conspiracy theory? Is it compatible with the official story? The official story says that this is just a pancaking event where the insides are all collapsing on top of each other, pushing out debris from any window that was damaged or open. But the conspiracy theorist says this is evidence of an explosive device going on inside. Which one of those stories is true? Stephen Jones believes it was thermite, and he claims to have actually found evidence of thermite in the wreckage. He went to New York City and collected these four samples, and people have been asking, right, is that evidence that there was thermite used in the building? I don't know, because I haven't seen these samples, and I'm not a chemistry major, I don't know how to detect if that was actually an, a byproduct of a thermite uh, um, uh, explosion or, or uh, burning, excuse me. Um, so we don't really know. And uh, if it isn't thermite, then he's way off. This actually could be other things. And uh, uh, Stephen Jones has not released these four samples to scientists. He does not trust the scientists to look at it. But scientists that look at these pictures claim that these are other types of metal that uh, may have uh, cooled in the burning of the buildings, and that he's just picking random samples that look unusual. So I don't know what to say about that. All I can say is that there's a bunch of people who are running experiments using thermite to try to show how a steel girder can be cut with thermite. And I think they're amazing experiments. Uh, it does show the possibility that the buildings could be taken down with thermite, but it doesn't show me any proof that it was. It's just a possibility. So he claims that jet fuel can't melt the steel beams, and that's why the thermite had to be used. This is a very common trope that's used all over the internet, and that the steel beams were coated in fireproof foam, so they shouldn't have gotten hot or melted. They can't melt because the jet fuel doesn't burn that hot. Steel beams uh, melt at 2750 degrees Fahrenheit, but the jet fuel only burns at 2,000 or 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit, so the jet fuel could not have melted the steel beams. That's the argument that he made very early on in, um, after, in, after 9 11. So that's the claim the jet fuel doesn't melt the steel. But the point is, it doesn't have to melt the steel. What he's talking about is the melting point. The metal turns to liquid at 
2,700 degrees, it doesn't have to turn to liquid to fall apart. You can actually destroy a steel beam uh, in lower uh, damage. So here are a bunch of websites of people who have demonstrated. You can look at them yourself. Just Google it and show all of the different examples of people who show that just using jet fuel, you can actually turn a steel beam into wreckage. You can bend it. Uh, you can break it. Uh, you can um, twist it into any shape, shape you want. Um, so there's plenty of evidence that it does destroy the steel. And experts agree that you only need to uh, cause the beams to lose their structural integrity. And the steel begins to lose its strength at just 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the steel loses 50% of its strength at 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. So if jet fuel burns at 2,000 degrees, then they've lost most of their strength. They lose 90% of their strength at 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So if only 10% of their strength is holding those buildings up, you can imagine the buildings are going to come down. And that's just using jet fuel alone. You don't need explosives. Plus, the, uh, the fireproofing foam was lightweight and fluffy, could be easily removed through a, a plane passing through them, exposing the metal to the heat of the flames. And therefore, uh, the heat would expose those or would heat up the exposed part of the beams, that metal would transfer the heat throughout, because I think you know that metal transfers heat pretty rapidly. That's why you shouldn't lick frozen poles. And that the rugs, curtains, and furniture, and paper could intensify the heat, making it even hotter in there, uh, causing those parts of the buildings to collapse. There's some puppy butts. The Pentagon. The Pentagon was hit by a plane that uh, no one caught footage of, and that is suspicious that we don't have any security footage of it other than one little thing located way over here. Uh, it's actually a traffic uh, security camera that catches it, but there's no, well, people have been arguing since then if there is a plane in that footage, and I'll show you the picture of that in a minute. So people say that there weren't any planes hitting the Pentagon. It was just a rocket, it's the most popular theory, and that no one saw a plane hit the Pentagon, that is patently false. There are hundreds of testimonies, and I have a um, Word document of all of the eyewitness testimonies that claimed they saw a plane hit the Pentagon, and it's several pages long and referenced with citations. Uh, I should have brought that with me today. Uh, there were no plane parts found at the Pentagon. That's also patently false, as I'll show you in just a minute. That the hole in the Pentagon was too small for a 767. I think it was actually a 757 that hit the, the Pentagon. And um, they also claimed that no lamp poles were hit in front of the Pentagon. So here are the lamp poles, and this is a picture they usually show. Right? If the plane came from this direction and um, hit that building, why didn't it hit any of these? The answer is because it wasn't here. It was located just to the side of this picture. Hold on a second. Here's the plane passing across the highway, missing the plane poles that you're looking at here, but hitting these five poles here. And here are the pictures where there was some missing rung here, perhaps where a wing hit it, and this lamppost, which was cut in half and hit this taxi cab right after the plane, or right after the Pentagon was hit. So how do you explain that with a rocket? There is evidence that the poles were hit. You can see that in the photographs. Here's the picture of the security camera claiming that there was a plane zooming by, but notice that in the picture, you can't actually see the plane. All you see is a dust trail. Some people claim that looks like a plane there, and then you see explosion with the dust trail going into it. So is that a rocket? Is it a plane? We can't really see because it's behind this object. So people have been scrutinizing over that, trying to say, is that a plane? Is it a rocket? Or as one conspiracy theorist said, it might be a frozen fish. I don't know why he says that. But some theorists are claiming that. So the, plane, the claim that there's no uh, planes at the Pentagon, there are plane parts all over the Pentagon. They were just picked up pretty quickly because the FBI were on top of that immediately. The Pentagon officials actually did a sweep of the land, and there are pictures of the sweep as they're looking for plane parts, picking them up and collecting them for evidence. We still have these, by the way. So the question is, were they planted by the FBI or were they removed by the FBI, since you don't see them in later pictures? 
This is on the road right outside the Pentagon. And where does this fire come from? So if the plane impacts over here, and it was a rocket that hit, why is there fire all along the front of the building? Is that because jet fuel was spewing out from the wings and, and igniting those parts of the building? We have people who were in that side of the building who uh, have survival stories of trying to get out of the room even though the floor was burning hot. You've heard some of those stories just this past weekend, in fact, if you were watching the news. And there are plane parts found inside the Pentagon. You can see the engine here and here. You can see the landing gear. Inside the plane, we already showed you that picture. Here is the landing gear parts, also found inside the Pentagon. Tires, same tread. Tires. Uh, tire uh, hub, uh, well, uh, frame there that looks identical to a 757's tire well. Bears for you to look at. Then there's building seven. Let's see if I can get through this in enough time, right? Building seven, I'll just kind of uh, talk about briefly. I think this is losing its battery. So building seven is located away from the Twin Towers, but it's within the collateral damage of the Twin Towers falling. So building one and two collapsed, and then six or seven hours later, building seven collapsed. And you can see that it is within the radius of damage and people say, is, was that enough damage to bring down Building 7? You can see here, as the building is collapsing, that some of the debris is going around and past Building 7. So there was damage to the building. Nobody doubts that. There's actually a YouTube video of a cameraman who's wandering through the building in the hours between the Twin Towers collapsing and uh, Building 7 collapsing. You can actually see the innards of the building, and it's vacant. It's, it's gutted down below. And it does enough damage to some of the, the tiers that you can actually see that uh, some of the uh, structural damage uh, may have been caused by the heat of the generators down below. There were 42,000 uh, gal 42, gallons of diesel fuel for the backup generators stored below the World Trade Center 7. And that may have compromised uh, the, the uh, structural integrity of the building, causing it to collapse. And uh, that the temperatures reaching perhaps around 1100, uh, 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, may have burned around uh, 570 degrees Fahrenheit, and that that could be enough to cause the steel girders to expand. This is known as thermal expansion. And uh, if the girders do expand, their bolts are going to become loosened. And if they become loose enough, it can cause them to lose their strength collapse, and then the weight of the building would, would be gutted. And you can actually watch it as you see the building fall. Most of the conspiracy theorists film the World Trade Center falling from the outside, away from the uh, World Trade Center, looking into the World Trade Center's complex. But if you watch the collapse from the inside, you can actually see the, the divot that's causing the collapse. There's a specific column that it gives way, causing the 13th floor to give way. And once the 13th floor uh, collapses, all of the other 33 floors start to build up pressure, and they fall on top of it. So here is a, a schematic of the World Trade Center Building 7, and it is columns 30, uh, 79 and 44 that gave way due to structural damage. And those two columns were pivotal because if you lose strength there, there's a chain reaction that goes out from there, right, in all directions. And so once they lose their straight, and you can see that in the video, when the building collapsed, that part of the building goes down first, and the rest of the building uh, goes down with it. So the claim that uh, the odds are too astronomical, that a burning building would collapse straight down. They oftentimes cite other buildings that don't fall down, even though they're on fire. And yet uh, the collapse of the World Trade Center uh, is enough to actually cause damage to the other buildings that were next to it. Uh, Fitterman Hall, of one of the community colleges in New York City, and the Verizon building, there's Fitterman Hall, that also was damaged. It didn't collapse, but it was severe structural damage. So if that's sitting right next to Building 7, then uh, Building 7 must have suffered enough damage to cause it to collapse too. And the Verizon building next door 
also had to be renovated because it was heavily damaged as well. And they're right next to the World Trade Center 7. Um, I'm going to have to skip some of this part. The elevator shafts, there were no windows. I'm going to skip that part. There's some lions for you. So let's summarize some of the arguments of how these uh, theories work in comparison with each other. It's one thing to note that a lot of conspiracy theories begin with your imagination. And I think you just need to recognize that. When people present an alternative story, they're telling you a story that you're picturing in your mind. The question is, does that imaginary story have any physical hard evidence? And that's difficult to discern if you haven't done the research yourself. Because by their nature, uh, they are secretive conspiracies. It is necessary for weary conspiracy theorists to imagine what's going on, because if it's done in secret, we don't know what really happened. We don't know what's going on in the plane. We don't know what the government was doing. We don't, we don't have access to a lot of information. So the key question is then, how do you tell the difference between a real conspiracy, where there is conspirators doing things in secret, and an imaginary one? And the answer, I think we all know, is obvious. It's just the evidence. You have to weigh the evidence for each version of the story. So let's do that, and let's compare them to each other. Um, in, in order for these alternative stories to work, you have to imagine remote controls on airplanes. You have to imagine missile launchers being installed underneath a plane. You have to imagine that there were teams of FBI agents planting bombs or stockpiling thermite and then placing those thermite devices on the steel girders of the World Trade Center. You have to imagine that because no one sees it. No one has ever said they saw FBI agents entering in the World Trade Center with thermite devices or hearing them drill them or weld them onto the steel beams. Um, that's missing information. You have to imagine it. You have to imagine demolition experts planning to bring down the building, right? planning their own explosives to take it down through through regular explosives. You have to imagine a missile being fired at the Pentagon. Right? Who fired it? Where was it fired from? Who were the people who did that? How come this information is missing? Where's the data here? Or that Bush plotted the attacks. You have to imagine that because you don't have access to Bush's mind. I don't have access to it. You don't have access to it. You don't know. So here are all of the different claims that conspiracy theorists have made throughout time, or throughout the 20 years uh, that I've been researching this. And there may be other parts that I haven't researched yet, but these are the ones that I have. And what I want to do is to show you all of the claims that have counter evidence. First, I'll mark those in red. These all have counter evidence to them, meaning that there's, they're, they're false, because the counter evidence shows uh, contrary to that. And here's the, in, the uh, bits of information that rely on pure imagination, marked in purple. So these are the ones that don't have any evidence for them. They're just hypothetically possible. So when you look at both of those in conjunction, and these are all the theories that I've looked at, then you see that most of the information has either been discredited or is just based on pure imagination. The only things that aren't is the explosion scenes before the collapse, and that works on both sides of the story. It could be a pancaking effect, or it could be bombs going off. I don't know. You don't know either. You weren't there. And the thermite was found at the site. I don't know. I didn't see it. I don't know. I can't tell you if that was thermite or not. Uh, but maybe there was. Does that mean that it wasn't a plane that brought down the building just because you found thermite there? Or that the uh, World Trade Center was evacuated ahead of time before the collapse? They knew it was going to collapse. Uh, is that signs of a conspiracy? Or did the engineers recognize that this building is in danger? I, I did skip over one of the th conspiracy theories that uh, the BBC said that the World Trade Center had already collapsed before it was on. And what's funny about it is that the person saying that the World Trade Center 7 had collapsed is standing in front of World Trade Center 7. Now, the BBC has been asked about that, and, and they said, well, that was a mistake. They had heard from somebody that it was going to collapse, and that the person who reported it said that it had collapsed. And they did know it was going to collapse. That's why they had it evacuated. So that's another conspiracy theory out there. And you can watch that on, on YouTube. BBC's uh, admitted that they made a mistake in reporting, as people do. So you want to figure out which of these explanations is the best one. This is what uh, we do in logic class to try to figure out which explanation has the most warrant. And you have to ask which is more believable. Is it more believable that 
Terrorists hijacked four planes and crashed them into buildings, causing them to collapse? Or is it more likely that the government agents faked the hijackings and, sorry, I misspelled that, using military rockets and airplanes, thermite devices, and hidden explosives to stage the most widely recorded mass casualty event in history while framing 19 Saudi nationals for an excuse to go to war in Iraq? Which of these theories do you think makes more sense? And so I actually looked at uh, um, the criteria for doing this. I don't think we're going to have time to get into all of this, but uh, where am I at here? Oh, I do have time for this, yeah. If you want to evaluate which theory is the most uh, plausible, first identify what the alternatives are, what could explain it. Determine whether the explanations are actually causally possible. Right? Could this have happened? What's, and then look at the evidence for each explanation to say, well, what's the probability for each theory? And that requires a lot of work. I've been doing this for 18 years. And you're seeing the outcome of all of it. This is why I say I could, t I could spend five hours talking about this and not run out of material. There's literally 100 slides on this PowerPoint. <laughs> you guys have already seen that. You, you know, yeah, we know it's 100. Thanks, Brian. You were putting us to sleep. And then you apply your Occam's razors and say, look, if there are more details needed to fill in the gaps where the evidence is lacking, the less likely it is to be true because you're just inserting ideas to fill in the spaces for what you think may or may not be true. So let's just compare four theories real fast. The government faked 9-11 by flying remote control cargo planes into the Pentagon and World Trade Center. Or that the government planted bombs in the World Trade Center, bringing them down through explosives and or thermite. Or that the government conspired with Al-Qaeda to arrange for the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. They colluded together. Or that 19 men from Al-Qaeda worked alone to fly passenger planes into those buildings, causing them to collapse. Let's look at the evidence for each one of those. We'll start with the first one. The evidence, uh, that, sorry, the evidence of the first one, excuse me, is just that there was a report from Fox News saying it was a cargo plane. That's the evidence. There's no other evidence that it was a cargo plane. There's no military people saying, yeah, I, I remote controlled that plane into a building. There's no missing planes. There's no missing rockets. The, the military, uh, there's no, there's no um, whistleblowers, is what I was trying to say. Uh, the second theory says that the government planted bombs or thermite to bring the buildings down. And the evidence for this is that the firefighters reported hearing explosions when the Twin Towers fell. Uh, that's the evidence for an explosion. Uh, maybe the picture with the windows being popped out, but that fits with the popular explanation as well. Or that the government conspired with Al-Qaeda to arrange the attacks themselves. There's just no evidence for that. I don't even know why people think the US government would do that, especially when um, they spend so much time fighting terrorists in other countries. But then when you look at the evidence for the official story, you see that we have eyewitness accounts of the people who were trained as pilots. We have the journal of Mahatma, uh, Muhammad Atta, De declaring he was going to do it. We actually have phone calls and radio transmissions that recorded it happening. Zacharias Mosul actually pleaded guilty to conspiracy as one of the masterminds of this. Al-Qaeda has tried similar things in the past regarding the World Trade Center, 1993. They tried to bomb it from below. Didn't work, but they were trying to topple the towers from the basement. And that Osama bin Laden actually warned he was going to strike again and claimed credit for it in the years that followed. Why would Osama bin Laden create, claim credit for it? Wouldn't it be to his advantage to say, I didn't do this, the US government did it. But no, he took credit for it. So there's a lot of evidence that shows that the official story is legitimate. And how many people would it take to pull this all off? Are all of these people colluding to pull this off, and not one person has stepped up and said, I was in on it. That's a lot of people that are trying to keep this a secret. I find that hard to believe, because people don't keep secrets very well. What is the likelihood of that many people keeping a secret? And notice, this is not proof of a conspiracy. 
It's about the anomalies, not the whistleblowers. They're always pointing to the people who say things, well, I didn't he see a plane. Well, that's not evidence. There's no whistleblowers, people coming from the inside and saying, I was in on it. I did this. And what kind of person would do that? And can you imagine that? Hey, Fred, so I got this idea. What kind of person would do that? So the conspiracy theorist says the government did 9-11, but I don't know what that means. That's very vague. There's no specifics. They don't give names. They don't give details. It's all vague information. So is it possible? It's possible, but it's not likely. The extraordinary power that is necessary to pull off such a world event would be extraordinary. It's, it requires extraordinary feats, extraordinary power, extraordinary time frame. And using one conspiracy theory to explain the lack of evidence about another conspiracy theory just adds to this. People piggyback on this, and they try to bring in the Rothschilds, and they try to bring in Clinton, and they try to bring in um, uh, all sorts of other agencies. The, the UK was involved in this somehow. The probability, and this is my last slide, probability dictates that you should assume innocence until proven guilty, right? Don't just assume that somebody's guilty of something unless you have evidence for it, right? The burden of proof lies in showing guilt. And until you can show that with evidence, you have to assume they're innocent. And that conspirators are likely to leak, that people can't keep things a secret. So how is it that that many people can orchestrate such a large event and yet, no one has squealed. No one has blown the whistle. And the more people involved, the less likely it is to be a secret, right? Somebody's going to let it slip. Think about how legitimate conspiracies have worked in the past. And the more complicated the conspiracy, the less successful it will be. To pull this off would be amazing, right? To, to orchestrate all of that, to cover it up, blame 19 Saudi nationals, and to say that, that that's the proof. That's impossible, or all near impossible, I would say. So I'll just say, my kitten Piper, thanks, thanks Mew, for coming. And we'll open it up for Q&A at this point. So thank you. Questions? Was that compelling or not? Oh, sorry, Nabu. Um, I can't tell for sure because I haven't polled every student, but when I do teach this in my classes, particularly my logic class, um, I've had some hard-nosed conspiracy theorists start to loosen up. And that's saying something, right? Some people that were really hardcore and, and perhaps even threatened my life. <laughs> um, you know, the people that were just really angry with me. And by the end of it, I usually give this in a series of two lectures, not just one. So it was compacted there. There's a lot more I could talk about. Um, yeah, uh, the more I talk about it, I think people start to see. So you think this is compelling, that 9-11 was not an inside job? Yeah. I would be curious to take a, a, a survey here, right? Because I would love to hear people online watching this, people watching the recording, people who are here, you know, uh, if only we could do that sort of anonymous survey where people would honestly say whether or not they believed the 9-11 conspiracy theories and whether or not this actually changed their mind. But um, let's, let's get into it. I mean, let's, let's talk about it. I'm willing to wrestle if somebody wants, not physically wrestle. I'm willing to intellectually wrestle with you if you want to talk about uh, some of the, the points we made. Like I said, that was just a brief overview of all of it. It's almost always the assumption of guilt, right? So people start with the assumption that the government is evil and from that conclude that the government staged 
So it comes from a, a deep-seated emotion, I think, because they get them angry quickly. And, and I see that in my class. I'm watching my students carefully. You know, in fact, it was very hard to do this over Zoom because I couldn't see anyone's faces. And they were completely silent on Zoom. But face to face, I get to read the room. And um, you know, when you start talking about it, the questions I get in response are not about the details, because they don't know physics, they don't know chemistry, they can't really argue the points that I made about thermite or, or architecture. But the things that they do say are, but you know, what about this conspiracy? And they'll point to how the US government did the Tuskegee cases or the, uh, the Vietnam you know, explosion or the, um, uh, 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 sorry, what am I trying to say? The, uh, Contra Intel, is that what it was called? The in Iran Contra. I'm, I'm trying to say that, and I'm trying to say another one in its place. I forget what the other one is. Um, but there are um, uh, government conspiracies that have occurred pretty poorly, right? The Watergate uh, scandal, I think, was one of them. But look at how poorly that went. So here's a conspiracy that was revealed. Um, nobody has shown that kind of evidence for this, so I'm still left looking at the evidence and saying, don't you see the evidence is highly in favor? And a lot of times, people try to attack me on the minutia. So I get into a specific detail and we start looking specifically at the World Trade Center 7 or we look specifically at the Pentagon and um, uh, that's where they start looking for the details and we have to go, we have to do a deep dive at that point. And so, uh, that's where people start to, to loosen up, is when you get into the details, I think that they start to see that there is uh, counter evidence to those uh, detailed evidence, you know, the, the, the parts that they think that they've heard. Because if you only hear part of the story, I, that happened, I think, even when I started this lecture, I, I was showing you the casting of suspicion, and I talked about Bush's investments, and I saw a bunch of people nod their heads. And I thought, oh my gosh, right, so this is working. <laughs> And I haven't even you know, told you to believe it. I was just giving you reasons to be suspicious, and yet people were like, oh, yeah. And they started to see it. So it does have an effect on us. In fact, I'm, I'm wanting to do a new lecture on this uh, conspiracy theory with regard to beliefs versus aliefs. Uh, Chris Kramer was talking about that. And I'm starting to wonder if there isn't an emotional pull to this. It's not just about beliefs. It's about our emotions. It's how we feel. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I want to say, for me personally, it has been a logical change. Because when I first saw that documentary in 2002, I was blown away by it. And I, I was going around asking people, have you guys seen this? So I propagated that conspiracy theory. Sorry about that. Uh, because I was like, you know, I, I want someone to explain this to me. I was emotionally moved by it. But I kept trying to suspend my judgment because that's what I was told by my professors, right? Don't, don't give in to just the first thing that you learn. Don't just you know, quickly change your opinion. Look at the evidence. And so I want to say that I, I changed my opinion about 9-11 from a logical standpoint. But maybe the emotions had subsided by then. I don't know. Um, I don't know how often logic changes people's minds. But um, I do think that it has some effect. I want to say it's like more like a seed that grows, whereas emotions more like wind that blows. You know, the seed grows and it takes months to grow. That's logic. It takes months to, for people to accept hard truth. But the emotions come and go like the wind, and they obviously s s persuade us much faster. So um, I don't know. Did you, did you have another follow-up question? Good. Thank you. Yeah, I do think it, it, it's coming from a growing suspicion that you know people believe in the UFO conspiracy theories, flat earth conspiracy theories, um, uh, other government conspiracy theories, uh, vaccines. Um, you, know, you can go on and on about the different types of conspiracy theories that are out there. And what we've noticed in the data as we uh, survey people and ask you know, people who believe in conspiracy theories is that if a person believes in one conspiracy theory, they're more likely to accept all the other ones as well. So that's what seems to happen. And all of that blossomed when the internet was invented. That we've been studying conspiracy theories for over 50 years. At least all of the books that I have have people who have been studying conspiracy theories for 50 years, since the 70s. That's when this became a discipline in philosophy. 
and the other uh, sciences as well, psychology and whatnot. But there was a marked shift with 9-11, and that was around the time when the internet came out, and that's, I think, what made the 9-11 conspiracy theory so popular, is that they were, it wasn't just word of mouth. Word of mouth transmission takes years to get out. The internet goes around the world in a second. And so I think that, um, I think, what was your question? Yeah, so I don't think that they're giving up because they're being inundated with it. We just talked about this in logic class today, that the more you're exposed to information, the more likely you're willing to accept it. So if you hear something over and over again, and it doesn't take long to just Google 9-11 conspiracy theory or 9-11 truth, and you'll see the, the flood of websites that comes at you, even with the you know, YouTube ban that's going around, right? YouTube still has 9-11 conspiracy theories on it. And yet, here's the funny thing is, because I, I, I'm always searching them, uh, I go to those YouTube channels, and um, I'm watching their conspiracy theory, and when you read the comments in the comment section below, it says, you know, see how the government's trying to take this down from us? And I'm like, it's up. Like, you're looking at the video, and you're commenting on it. It's up. You can't say the government's taking it down, because it's still there. Anyways, that, that blows my mind that people are writing in the comment section. So I think it's just they're inundated with it. I think it's honestly the exposure effect, right? People keep hearing about it. And the more you hear about it from multiple sources, the more you think it's true. So I think that's partly why it still persists. And then, of course, uh, political bias. So when the 9-11 conspiracy theory first came out, it was propagated by Democrats to say that George Bush should not be the president. Um, then it was propagated by Republicans when Obama was in president, and then it was uh, propagated again by both parties. I think it was bipartisan by the time Trump became president. And now there's conspiracy theorists for 9-11 in both political parties, which is making it even more pervasive. So that, I think, has a lot to do with it. What else? I love talking about this, so I want, I want this conversation to go on all night, so you better get a a blanket and a pillow, because we're going to be here for a while. One of the key points that I made in the lecture was that conspiracy theories begin with your imagination. And I think that's a key point. But what Mark is saying right now is that there is something else that's going on that's fueling the imagination. It's deeper than the imagination. It's our need for an explanation. And I remember that day, standing there watching the news, watching the buildings collapse, asking, why is this happening? I want an explanation. And I think we were all asking that, for those of you who were alive and you know, cognizant enough to be aware of what's going on. We wanted an explanation, and we're not satisfied with not knowing, and that's when our imagination starts to take over. So I think that what was happening to me and several others was that the official story wasn't there at first, because even the news reporters couldn't give it. The, the government wasn't sharing any information, because they didn't either know or they didn't want to admit what was, what was happening. And so we were just left with a vacant gap and I think that because we, we have this need to know, we're not comfortable with uncertainty, we then start filling in the gap with plausible explanations. We come up with our own explanations, and that's when the imagination kicks in. And once we've imagined it, especially if we rehearse that imagined story over and over in our head, it becomes solidified, and we start to believe it stronger because we've seen it play out in our head over and over again. And, and I think that starts to develop neural pathways that become 
set. That actually may go to your question too. Why do people still believe it after 20 years? Because they've developed neural pathways to rehearse this and to reconstruct their whole world based on it. And it's kind of stuck, right? That's why, that's why old people have, uh, are very reluctant to, to, to change their beliefs because they've rehearsed them for so long. Uh, Dan. Oh, wow. So it was, I, I remember thinking this, and maybe I heard someone say this, or maybe I, that, I, I don't remember, but the night of 9-11, uh, when uh, Bush addressed the public, and I was at a pizza parlor, and everybody was quiet, I remember thinking, or right around that time, I remember thinking that the, uh, the, the plane that crashed into the field was actually taken down by the Air Force. Yeah. And so I always thought that, Yeah. I mean, I know it's not rational, but I still like, kind of believe that. And it may not even be a conspiracy, because what, what Dan's saying is that if uh, Flight 93 was shot down by the Air Force, right, we can imagine that happening even with the official story. And that was a conversation they had, and that's one of the recordings you can listen to as the, uh, the pilots are talking to the people on the ground and saying, do I have permission to fire? Because they were looking at Flight 93. They did see Flight 93. They had it in their sights. And we can imagine them shooting it down. In fact, I think we have evidence that, was it Cheney, uh, Vice President Cheney, gave the order to say, you have permission to shoot down a passenger plane if it's going to happen again, because he had already seen the first two hit, or maybe the first three it hit. I think it was after the Pentagon. It was immediately after the Pentagon, or, or right before it, seconds before it, uh, that he gave the order you could shoot it down. So you can imagine that happening. There is counter evidence to that, though. I don't know if you've seen this. OK, maybe you already know this by now. The counter evidence is that the flight recorder actually has the struggle of the passengers in the cockpit. And they're screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die, mayday, mayday, uh, we're going to die. And then it goes, it goes silent. So they were still alive. Now, they, either it went silent because they were shot down. I guess that doesn't quite t totally disprove your theory, uh, or that theory. But um, you know, the, the wreckage itself. It's all right there. It wasn't scattered. And so it seems like the plane went down intact. And I would just bring that up because it's like, it's something that's been in my head for yeah. uh, almost yeah. 20 years. Yeah. You know, like, so I'm like, that, that, at least like the first couple days of you know, the tragedy, that was something that just somehow yeah. got my head. And it just it just stayed there. Yeah. yeah. Probably because you imagined it to be true. Yeah. Uh, Kim had her hand up first. Yeah, they fuel each other. Yes. And people are starting to weave them all into one grand yeah. theory. That, yeah, that aliens are involved in 9-11 and that vaccines are part of the aliens' plans. Right, so there's a bunch of things that are being brought together. Michelle.
it is more rational. And notice that a lot of things in life don't have evidence out there for it. So, you know, um, what's a you know, good example of this? Um, yeah, did Bush know? Did he receive a report that 9-11 was going to happen? Uh, what, what evidence would we have? Are, they, are there cameras on him at all times for the, them to see this? Sometimes we, we don't have any record of it, right? We don't have a record. There's no one filming a plane shooting down another airplane. Um, so uh, we have to kind of piece things together, literally, from the pieces, right? Look at the wreckage and try to figure out, was this plane, plane blown up or did it all fall into this little crevice? Um, and that's, that's, that takes a lot more work. It's a lot harder. But you're right that our instinct is to come up with the, the most logical or most plausible explanation. Jeremy. Uh, a question from the back. From the Good. Uh, to what extent does the continuous exposure to conspiracy create as a weapon? Is this a modern way to undermine government or does it work? Or is that just more conjecture than conspiracy? <laughs> Good. Yeah, is it a conspiracy to think that... Um, that uh, the, the government, oh, are people using conspiracy theories as a weapon, a political weapon? And that is possible. Uh, certainly that has been used throughout history. I mean, you just look back, even before modern day technology, people used conspiracy theories to try to wage a political war. Uh, perhaps one of the earliest conspiracy theories that I know of is the, the fire of Rome. Nero, you know, tried to uh, set a fire uh, in the city and blame it on some people, use them as scapegoats, and, and use that for political motivation. Um, that's happened throughout history. So yes, it is used as a weapon. That's the answer to the first question. And the second question is, um, is that a conspiracy itself? It can be if you think that's always the case. So you have to be cautious there that you're, um, you know. Are, what's the motivation for 9-11 truthers? And I, I really do think it's political on both sides because I've seen Democrats and I've seen Republicans endorse the 9-11 conspiracy theory. So I don't think that it's one party or the other. Now, I don't know what the percentages are. That's an interesting thing. I think that would be an interesting study to do is to find out how many in each party actually endorse uh, the 9-11 truth. Um, what I do find is that people will start to push conspiracy theories when the person they don't agree with is in office. And I see that happening a lot. So you see uh, anti-Republican conspiracy theories being published when there's a Republican office. You see anti-Democrat conspiracy theories being published when there's a Democrat in office. Um, so it is being used as a weapon. I think that's correct. Um, but we shouldn't just always assume that's the case. Sometimes it's just like we were saying, people want an explanation. Michelle. I need to repeat that because I'm afraid the people online can't hear that comment because that was a good comment that um, it may not be an intentional weapon that people are using. That If it is motivated by politics, then it may be just an emotional weapon. Am I saying it correct? That is an emotional weapon unintentionally being used to just express how I feel and therefore they're not trying to use it as a weapon explicitly, but it's happening implicitly, maybe even unbeknownst to the person. Uh, I think that's probably true probably true of most of politics, wouldn't it? Yes. That's an interesting example because the vaccine conspiracy theory is based on a guy named Andrew Wakefield who was trying to create his own vaccine. So he was trying to propagate a suspicion toward the MMR vaccine because he wanted to sell his own and make a profit. And first he had to dismantle the standard and create suspicion about it. So um, 
So I think that there is an intentional aspect to it. There, there could be ulterior, ulterior motives that do occur from time to time where, well, uh, the one I mentioned about Vietnam, right? That the US government faked an explosion on one of their ships to justify going to war with Vietnam. Now we now know that because there were whistleblowers and there's plenty of evidence to show that that, uh, that wasn't really a bomb that uh, hit the ship. I don't even think the ship was even hit, if I remember correctly. Sorry, I don't know the details of that conspiracy theory at all. They set up what charges? Depth charges. And did it damage the ship? Okay. So the ship was actually, on, so there's your evidence for you, right? And that was intentional to get people to justify going to Vietnam. So you can see that I think that there are people who are trying to start the conspiracy theory for political power, and that does happen. But again, we shouldn't assume that's always the case. Yeah. But it's insightful, isn't it? Yeah, it may, it may be that people just do it un, unwittingly at times. Ten years ago, most of my students could tell you everything about 9-11, what they were doing that day, um, and all of their thoughts about it. But now I'm starting to see this chasm where half of my students don't even know that there are conspiracy theories about it. And those that do, that's all they've ever heard. They've never heard the official story. And so there are some students who, when I actually told them I was giving a lecture about 9-11 conspiracy theories, they were like, conspiracy theories? Don't you mean the government did that, right? They, they, and, and funny, they're not here today, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but you know, that's all they've ever heard is the conspiracy, because they live on the internet, right? So there's that demographic. But there's also a whole group of people who don't even know what happened on 9-11, like you said, and I think they're just apathetic. So I don't know if there's a trend happening, but it does seem to be that um, less people care about this. I'll just say that. I think that less people care about this now, which makes me wonder, why did I wait 20 years to give this lecture? <laughs> because I've been working on research, that's why. <laughs> yes? And it didn't affect you, right? No, no. Yeah. It was traumatic. I mean, I think we all suffered from PTSD from 9-11. And therefore, I think that, uh, that those, those people have more invested in it. That's why it's an emotional issue. I don't think it is an emotional issue for the younger generation. Yeah. Yeah. Generational disconnect. So people who weren't there, they don't know about it. I've, I'll just be honest. I did not care two cents about Pearl Harbor. And my parents would always bring that up. What is it, December 8th? Is that what it was? 7th, excuse me. I got it off by a day. And they would always talk about it. I'm like, who cares? But to them, that was a life-changing experience. And I think that's what's happening here. The generational disconnect I think that you're referring to is just that you know, time passes and people just don't relate. So I think that's good. That's insightful, too. So maybe this lecture will become old hat. I don't know. We'll see. But I hope that you saw something in this lecture that helped you understand other conspiracy theories, too. I'm always trying to just you know, present to you the, 
criteria for how to evaluate any conspiracy theory so that you don't just fall for any one that you find on the internet. I hope that you're able to kind of see through how the patterns are. And that's why I love doing this, because now that I can see the patterns, I'm seeing this all over the place. I mean, conspiracy theories are just rumors writ large. And when you, you read the data about the similarities between how rumors are spread and how conspiracy theories are spread, it's almost identical. And, and we love rumors, right? We love gossip. And I think that's what makes conspiracy theories so entertaining, is that it's, it's drama, it's exciting, sex, lies, subterfuge. OK, yeah. <laughs> the title of my next lecture, yep. Any other questions? Yes. Those are really good points. So I like the thing about scam artists, right? There is something to that, you know, that scam artists uh, thrive on that kind of uh, deceiving people. But you're saying there's just even a personal uh, benefit to this, and that's that it, it feels good to be in the know. And we've seen that by surveying people who believe in conspiracy theories, that you don't want to be gullible, right? You don't want to be a person who just believes anything, but you also don't want to be left out. And so if everyone else is talking about 9-11 truthers and you're the one who, person who doesn't know about it, you're like, well, I don't want to be the person left out. So there is a social bonding effect. We see that explicitly with the flat earth conspiracy theory. Flat earthers have a society where they get together and they all talk about, at their conferences, they don't talk about flat earth, they talk about how they feel ostracized. And it's one of the most common trends that people who believe in conspiracy theories feel disenfranchised. So there's an emotional component to conspiracy theories that satisfies us psychologically, not logically. It, it satisfies our emotions to say, I, I know something that you don't, and I'm now part of a group that we can all kind of connect with and bond with. And none of that's logical, but it is psychological. So there's a descriptive fact that's going on here that I think causes these conspiracy theories to perpetuate and spread, right? And I think that's a, that's a brilliant point. The data sh uh, backs that up, that uh, a lot of people uh, who are more disenfranchised or who just even have the perception of feeling disenfranchised uh, are more willing to accept conspiracy theories because it satisfies an internal desire for retribution or um, an internal desire for explanation, right? We want to know. And I think that, um, yeah, that's, that's a big part of it too. It's not always malevolent. Just a story. Yeah. 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 So hopefully it shouldn't be old hat because, um, yeah. Um, it. If the eyewitnesses all die away, uh, what evidence will we have at that point? We can no longer go to those people. And we're already losing them. Um, it's funny how many people at New York City are now dying of lung diseases and stuff like that. Uh, 
that's why I think these recordings are so essential, even though it's hard. It's like a paradox, isn't it? Trying to get someone to interview about this is probably tedious for them because they're sick of talking about it. Everybody asks them, tell me your story. But there's a few people that have been going around. I was actually working at Wabansi College when a, a guy came who was on in the World Trade Center when the plane hit and he was able to get out. Uh, he actually was exiting the building as the second plane hit and he was just below the plane hit and managed to get out of the building. That was an amazing story. And he, he goes around traveling, but he's rare. And I think that you're right, we should record all of these testimonies. You know, uh, I think that would be great. To, uh, so it doesn't turn into just a story that you could easily manipulate. Yeah, we need to record stuff. The problem is that there's not motivation for that. And maybe what we need to do to try to combat conspiracy theories is to somehow finance those organizations to put stuff up on YouTube. Um, I think there was no motivation for people to do it because there's no money in that. The YouTube artists were like thriving on the fact that they could put their information out for free, but the scientists and the you know, the, I don't know, the conspiracy theorist professors or whatever, you know, the people who could combat it didn't have the inclination because it's a lot of time and energy to do this. But um, I'm hoping that my lectures are doing that. I hope that I'm uh, teaching people how to think critically so that they can sort through the data and not fall prey to some of these fallacies. So maybe we need to figure out ways to, uh, to encourage that. Okay, thank you everyone. I wanna talk all night long, but thank you for coming and I hope that you enjoyed the lecture. Um, come again next time. There's gonna be another lecture. Um, when's your lecture? No. November. November on uh, his the history. You wanna talk about it? Yeah, the politicization of history, how politics has influenced it, good. Thank you.